Well, another month of YouTube video content has washed over us all. A shorter month than usual, as it is February. Um, and we're here to talk about the top 10 of the month. Like we did last month. I like this format. We didn't end up doing top 5 worst videos of the month, which I said maybe I would do. But I, I don't know. I really didn't see any bad ones. Well, I saw some bad ones, but not enough to like get mad at, I guess. So there was really no motivation to do that. In terms of the top 10 list, I think it's probably stronger this month. Uh, there's a clear number one, and the rest are kind of equivocal, I think. But we'll talk about all of that. I don't want to spoil the list here, you know what I'm saying? Um, is there anything else generally we need to talk about housekeeping regarding shit? Still in the second channel. Channel tra- second channel's doing all right. We've got like 100 subscribers now. Um, so we're doing fine. The people who want to see Digest are going to see it. Um... Do we have anything else to go over? I feel like I'm missing things, but I always feel like we're missing things at the beginning of these sorts of things. Um, There's one video, we'll talk about it when we get there, on where exactly the the February ends, because for me, it ends a, a few hours earlier than everybody else, and it always turns out that I think it's a lot of creators try to get videos out by the end of the month, so on the last hours of the month, they they like, ah, we've got to get it out, so they usually get it out like a few hours before, uh, in America, it becomes March, but it, like we're eight hours ahead of America or whatever. Um, so it technically came out for March on March the first for me. It's one Craft Dwarf video, uh, and I decide fuck it. There's a whole cra- there's three Craft Dwarfs, Craft Dwarf videos all under one uh, number here, and I may as well put that one in as well. And it was my favorite out of the three, so we'll talk about all that. As we get to it, spoiler alert, I guess. Fucking where you on already, and fuck you. So here we go. Top 10 analysis videos slash video essays of February 2021. At number 10, we've got Hansa vs. Kawada, Hansa vs. Kobashi, Kobashi vs. Williams, Walking the King's Road, episode 12 by Joseph Montecilio from January. In fact, it was February 20th, 2021. Now, the Walking the King's Road series is something I talked about on the old uh, version of this program, on the old version of Digest we used to do. This is not Anime Digest. Shut up, computer. Put that shit on mute. I open the videos up in the background so I can look through them and see if I have some shit that I forgot to talk about that I wanted to talk about, because I only take notes on certain videos, because I think I can improv with this one. The Walking the King's Road series is, like, the best series on YouTube. It should be shocking to anybody that was keeping up with that old Digest that this isn't, like, number one of the month. Uh, but this episode of Walking the King's Road is, uh, not as fun as the usual ones are, because, and this is intentional, um, it's about these three matches that are very highly regarded, but they're not really lore important to the story being told, really, in all Japan during 1993, I think, is the year all these matches take place, and, uh, the, the sort of lore that the, um, the, the, the video series has been explaining, throughout 12 episodes, now we're on 12. So it's sort of like, we have to talk about all these matches, but these matches don't really factor into the overall canon of the King's Road shit that's going on. Um, especially when the last one was probably the peak and the best video so far, and it was the first Kawada Misawa match that had big lore importance. And the tease at the end of that video I talked about endlessly on that Digest episode where we did cover that video a few months ago, and about how awesome the ending of it was, with the tease about how Kawada is going to turn on Misawa soon, and sort of the heel turn is coming, and the formation of the uh, demon army, or whatever it's called, the coolest name in in wrestling, Um, and sort of like, we had peaked there, and to just for the next episode that we've been anticipating, this last one came out in September, uh, that we've been anticipating for five months to be like, a bunch of talking about matches... I don't give a shit about wrestling. No one cares about wrestling. Wrestling's bad. It's the story that kind of draws us, draws us, or at least me, to these videos. Uh, especially somebody who hasn't seen any of these matches and knows uh, relatively nothing about all of this. It's kind of, it's just not as interesting. Uh, it's still fun. It's still uh, required. Required viewing, required reading to keep up with things. Uh, and the slow things are being explained in the background that are also, like, this is basically Kabashi arriving on the scene, and he will be a big player later on, as I have uh, been told, as I've inferred, as I've as I've known. So, in building that up, it's sort of like, I haven't seen a lot of Dr. Death, and just seeing, like, this is one of his most famous matches, and why everybody loves him, it's cute. And, I, and I've heard people talk about the Hanson-Kawada matches, and Kobashi matches as well. 
So yeah, um, they because we we sort of breeze over some more stuff because they uh, because Joseph basically s- explains that Kabashi's now number two in Misawa's faction, which means Kawada will have left by like the back half of the year, I assume. Um, but at the beginning, Kawada is still in. Uh, what the fuck is uh, his faction called? I'm blanking on all the faction names. But he's still in it at the beginning when he has the first match with Hanson. Look, we have the dates. One's in February, one's in July, and one's in August. So, yeah, about midway through, Kawada will have turns, so Kabashi can stand up. Um, but we're sort of covering these matches because they go together in this, and then I assume episode 13 will be about the turn and the and the fallout from that, which means the next one is the one we've got to be hyped for. But these videos take a while to make, so we're probably not going to get it going to get it for a few months. Um, like, the description here sums it up. Um, when he says, not every match fits into an extended narrative arc, some are simply excellent in their own right, acting as brief moments of respite. From the larger stories being told within All Japan, these three matches in 1993 are all excellent in their own right, but don't quite fit into the larger story of the year. But let's talk about them anyway. And that's sort of the video. So that's why... A Walking the King's Road video has to be. It just It's got to be on the list here. Um, but we put it at 10 because it, was, it wasn't it was as exciting as, as generally these videos are. Like, I would expect a new Walking the King's Road video, that's fucking number one of the month. Even if it was the best Walking the King's Road video, even if it was episode 11, it would probably still be number two for this month since we'll get to number one. Uh, you probably already know what it is. Um... But yeah, that's really all I have to say. There's nothing uh, too good. The production value, it has the same aesthetic. I still really like the music that's used in the video. Um, The presentation is really good. Talking about the matches, breaking them down. It's all quality stuff. It's just the lore density we come here for is lacking intentionally. He had to do it, I guess. But that's it for our number 10 video. I don't have anything else to say. But for number nine, if we move on quickly and concisely here, I don't even know if this video should fit, but we put another Game Theory Five Nights at Freddy's video on because I will never not be addicted to these videos. And I feel like there is a strong subsection of people that are like me, whereas they've never played a Five Nights at Freddy's video, but they just watch all these Game Theory lore videos about it because it is... The, the most interesting shit in the fucking world. They're, like, addictive. There's, like, 50 of these videos. There's legitimately, like, 50. Um, if you go back and, like, re- see the full playlist for you to catch up. It really is an, an internet, like, experience that I that I think everybody should do at some point is go back and watch all the Five Nights at Freddy's lore videos and how crazy this shit gets and the weird investigative uh, type of ways the theory videos go into it and the community dives into it to the point where when I was watching this, the state of play or whatever the PlayStation put out, they have the trailer for the new five nights of Freddy's game. And I'm, I'm basically understanding everything that's going on, even though it's like the 12th game in a franchise that I have like never played before and don't really have any interest in playing. Um, but yeah, it's just, I don't even remember what they say, what what Matt Pat's talking about in this one. Oh, it's 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 going back to um the logbook thing, which is such a, a, a cool concept. Basically, because there's either people that understand all of this shit or understand none of this shit. So let me try and give some indication of what these videos are about. Because you're like fifty videos about Five Nights at Freddy's. What the fuck is this shit about? Isn't this just a jump scare fucking machine game? There's this merchandising logbook that was put out about the Five Nights at Freddy's series. It's just like a coloring book. There's like word searches in it. Obviously, it's like a fun little kids book for uh, for the kids, even though Five Nights at Freddy's is a horror series. Very, very popular with kids, though, obviously. Um, and like in it are hidden like lore details because that's basically the FNAF like the thing that it's famous for, the reason why there are all these theory videos is because, like, what's actually going on in the story is buried in, like, promotional art and, like, things you've got to, like, codes you've got to figure out. If you've ever seen the five, the uh, Doki Doki Literature Club uh, game theory things where there's all these things hidden, hidden in codes and you have to do all these investigative things and put desperate little elements together to understand and get the story out of the game... Uh, it's exactly like that, but, like, on a much larger scale, and there's all these, like, theories about what's actually going on, 
and like the book tie-ins and all this shit and basically this is like a little fun book that you would think would just be a little merchandising thing to make some extra money but it's actually got very important lore reveals there's like codes on different pages that if you add up and then you put it into the word search or if you put it into this grid thing on it and you do these weird code things you can figure out the names of certain characters that are very plot important and this was revisiting that because uh there was like a massive in like 2018 i think there were a bunch of theories about this that matpad did um and uh now you can figure out another name for like the crying child which is a big lore important thing i don't want to explain all of that shit but somebody like they put another code into the word search and figured out another name though maybe they didn't and then it's just a general indication of where the um like the 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 narrative is going the next step there is like a big budget ps4 game coming out no ps5 game i guess Uh, because we're on the PlayStation 5 now, I have to remind myself sometimes. Um, And just talking about the novels and everything, it's just a fascinating, fascinating bit of internet history, where, like, all of these, like, this video has four, nearly five million views, and all these videos get, like, big views. It's probably the most popular thing Game Theory has ever done. Let me click on the Game Theory channel, sort by most popular, and see if it actually is the most popular thing. Um, I didn't even say the title of the video like I usually do. I just said... Um, uh, meme a Five Nights at Freddy's video. So what is it actually called? Game Theory. Did Reddit just solve FNAF? The Game Theorist. 21st of February. So in about 12 days, it got 5 million views. Now, that's a whole other thing. Now, if we sort by most popular, there's um, a Mirror's Edge Game Lab thing that I think was like a YouTube Originals thing. Yes, it was. That's got 67 million views. But then the rest of the most popular thing is all Five Nights at Freddy's, as you'd suspect. Uh, one from five years ago is the most popular. The clue that solves Five Nights at Freddy's. The 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 um the titles are uh, very self indulgent. It has all the game theory charm of being uh, quite over the top. Some may say cringy, but they're, they're, those people are cowards. The Matt Pat persona that everybody seems to have fifteen different issues for that all seem stupid. Um, it's all here. You know what you're getting into. Everybody's seen a Game Theory video before. This one, it was not particularly uh, rev- revelatory, um, but it was cute. It's another, like, I feel like there's sort of waves of this where, like, you can't really keep up with the videos as they come out. You've sort of got to wait for five to come out, then you go back and you watch all 50 fucking videos to get caught up on what the fuck is going on in the background lore of this fucking obscure turned, like, multi million dollar franchise. And it's something you just got to do at some point. It will be fascinating. It is some wild, wild shit. Um, I would recommend everybody at some point to do it. But this is just another another episode in that, and I thought it was a fun addition, and it was just more of the same, and I like it. So that's why that is number nine. I don't know if it fits with Digest, because it's not really a video essay. It's a theory video, literally. But it's got, like, all the makings of a video essay. Um... What is it? Number three or number two? Number three on this list is literally just like a podcast script. So we're, we're getting fast and loose with the definition of what we consider an analysis video or a video essay. Uh, I guess it is a theory using the video essay content, uh, like, what do you call it? Not content, you like concept. But it's not really an essay, it's just an edited video. I don't know if it counts, but it counts, motherfucker, because I make the rules around here. But we'll move on to number eight. Now, we've got Super Eye Patch Wolf. Now, this is what I do for Digest to... Uh, for these top ten lists, rather. I still call it Digest. Um, to cheat is that when I... I usually put creators. like So, number eight is Super Eye Patch Wolf, and it's got both of his videos from this month. So, um, I'm kind of cheating. But this will happen throughout, where, like, all the Craft Store videos count as one number, the Donkey videos, uh, and so on. But that's how we're fucking doing it. I want to talk about the videos. I generally don't think... Unless there's, like, a big, like, one of them is, like, a number five of the month and one of them is a number one of the month video, which they, I don't usually think, so I don't think there's that big of a difference. Um, both these videos are basically big Super Eye Patch Wolf videos. Um, the, one, the first one that came out was The State of Shonen Jump in 2021, uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf, February the 9th, 2021, and my favourite things in winter 2021, Super Eye Patch Wolf from February 28th, 2021. The last day of the month, he squeezed it in. Um, this is just more... These are two continuing series on the Super Eye Patch uh, Wolf channel. It's just more Super Eye Patch Wolf. You know the general quality you're going to get of, like, 
I don't know, an, an 8 out of 10 YouTube video with some interesting things to say. Um, both of these videos are recommendation machines. Uh, I talk about that concept a lot, about recommendation machine videos, and that's how I sort of see the appeal of most of the best Super Eye Patrol videos. I think I said that about Mother's Basement too. Uh, or it's just sort of like general knowledge about a bunch of things that could be interesting, so you can sort of use them as a jumping off point. Like, the state of Shonen Jump has always been the appeal of, like, talking about the new series that have come out, that if you're not keeping up with, like, the magazine, which I assume, like, 90% of the people who watch this video aren't, um, they're just generally curious about anime, and learning about the new series that come out, and him describing them for, like, a minute. I've always, I said this about, Super Mario Patch 12 and Mother's Basement are very similar in a, in a lot of ways, I think. Um, where it's like they have this really good ability to sort of like sum up a series in a minute to give you a quick recommendation, a rundown, and like one cool aspect of it that'll make it like stick in your mind and make you curious about it. Whether or not you actually follow through and checking it out probably depends more on your personality. It usually never works on me. But just generally making me aware of these certain things will continue in my brain. Chainsaw Man was like that, and eventually I did get into Chainsaw Man and read the whole thing. Um, and love it, you know? So that's how it, it usually works. So the Shonen Jump video was sort of summarizing which series, like, die. I, for this video, I actually went back and I watched all of them. Now, this series has been controversial in the past for him being uh, messy with the numbers and certain things like that. Apparently, he's seemingly corrected all of that. There wasn't any controversy, really, when this video came out. Um... Those videos are, like, on the, the video versions of these from four and three years ago. So, um, like, them, the watch through, like, watching all of these videos at once, uh, you notice, like, he basically recycled the script for some of them, for some of the series where he talks about them year after year. He sort of basically has the same summary, lightly reworded, um, which is fine. It's, it was just a neat thing I noticed. Um, but, uh... What, was, what else was I saying? But following, like, the track record of, like, which series survived and which ones didn't, and, like, if he was excited with one one year later and then three seconds later you click on the next video a whole year later and he's depressed that it got uh, cancelled or it's exploded in popularity. Like, I think the first one is all about Doctor Stone and the Promised Neverland as these young up-and-coming series, and then the next videos were like, oh, shit, they actually became big, uh, big series. Isn't that cool? Um... And he usually selects, like, one, like, I know in last year's, the one he selected at the end to talk about a lot more as sort of, like, the potential next big shonen thing um, was Chainsaw Man, and eventually that became a big thing. Now, the ending part of this video is more focusing on um, where, like, it seems like he has, at the end of all of the videos, he's always like, hmm, it seems like shonen is, like, they're going to have to come up with something clever to get them out of this hole because they sort of, uh, they need a big series because a bunch of their series are ending at various different points. Um, and the conclusion he's come to this time is that the Shonen Plus online, like, uh, subsidiary thing is what's going to get him through because Chainsaw Man Part 2 is going to be on that, uh, and Spike's Family is already a very popular series that's on that, and he talks about a bunch of other series that are on that, and sort of how Shonen Jump is uh, evolving with this online, uh, like, manga streaming service. Streaming? <laughs> I guess te technically... Wait, streaming pages? Is that a thing? Just their online uh, manga service. And sort of how that might be the uh, moving forward point. Um, but yeah, the summary of what's sold the most and the top 10 list and tracking how series have sort of died off or exploded in popularity. It's all fun to just keep track of and I, I guess quality information to be aware of. Um, so that's really the current state of Shonen Jump video. It's pretty good. It's got all the... Um, the general Super Eye Patch will presentational goodness, like, the editing's pretty pretty fun, the narration is usually good. I think his narration has got slightly worse over time. He, like, works in traditional YouTube tropes more uh, than I think he he used to, sort of, of sort of, like, the sometimes there's bad jokes in there now, and sort of things like that that sort of retract from the narration being as good as it is. Like, I feel like I like his more stoic Irish narration uh, voice, whereas sometimes he sort of tries to be the wacky, haha, this is time where I do a formulaic joke and everybody laughs. That goes over well in, like, Gigic videos. It's not nearly as bad as Gigic videos in terms of, like, bad comedy, but it, whenever he does that, it, it rarely lands. Um, there is an example of it landing in the next video we'll talk about. Um... 
but yeah, presentationally, it's still pretty top notch. Um, he talk, he, he, he portrays a lot of passion in the things he talks about and the things that he likes. And again, like the one minute summary thing, he's really good at it. It's sort of like, this is the one thing he's very good. He's very good with his descriptive language and like putting over something if he likes it. Like his intros to one piece in every video are like that, where he goes off and you can tell he loves that boy, one piece, that boy, monkey D Luffy. Um, and it's cute, but I think that's all we have to say about that video. Now, my favorite things of winter 2021, uh, I always really like these videos. Um, a bunch of the, rec- like, it's, again, a recommendation machine of all the cool shit that fucking came out. Like, and uh, you always miss some of it. Um, he talks about the Pokemon music video thing that got really popular. Um, I got an ad while I was scrolling through the timeline to see and remind myself what he talked about. This was the last video I watched before recording here, literally an hour ago, so it should be freshest in my mind. He talks about this Pokemon thing, then he talks about the Jenny Nicholson, he gives Jenny Nicholson a shout out, especially with the ghost, um, what the fuck was the thing, the Vampire Diaries video we covered last month on the top 10 list, um, and how cool it is. I really think Jenny Nicholson is really good. I thought about it a lot since then. Uh, about uh, that that va- that Vampire Diaries video. It's, like, really good. I think I put it at, like, nine last week, uh, last month, rather. It probably should have been a lot higher on that list. Probably, like, three. Probably behind the Matthew Mitosis video. Um, Matthew Mitosis video probably should have been number one last month instead of the top ten Cineflix list, which was, again, another recommendation machine. Um, but, yeah, the Jenny Nicholson shout-out is cute. Um... Then this dude that did a six-hour thingy about a dating sim that seems interesting. The only thing about recommending YouTube videos that didn't come out this month is, like, I can't justify watching them for Digest. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to um, go back and watching a, a, a YouTube video that didn't come out this month. Disgraceful. Why would I waste my time with these fucking disgusting YouTube videos? It's sort of the thought process I go through. I clicked on this dude's channel. I forget what his name is. Action Button or something? He has like a four-hour Last of Us 1 video that... Oh, that's something about something I've seen. So that would be interesting. I wonder if it's a negative or a positive one. Um, I'm curious. I subscribe. So a new video from this dude that comes out, even though all of his videos seem to be extremely long and come out once every few months because... uh, they're very fucking long. This video is literally six hours about some dating sim. Um, so if a new one comes out, like, next month, which I'm not assuming, again, um, maybe we'll check it out. We'll see. He's on the subscription box. We can see it. Then he shouts out this animated dude that did a cu- 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 cool three-minute thing. I have it open on a tab on my computer right now. I didn't watch it before we came out here, so I can't really give my take on it. Uh, but it's cute. I like when he recommends this shit. Uh, this shit, this stuff, this shit. Uh, then he goes into anime and manga, and he talks about how Harry Met Sally anime version, apparently. Um, I forget the names of all the anime stuff he recommended, but they both seem cool. There is a comment pointing out that a lot of the shit that he talks about, again, I said shit again, how mean and insensitive to the hours of work that go into these various things we're talking about. Um... All the stuff he talks about in this video, there's a comment pointing out that it's, like, all relationship-based stuff and people speculating about uh, his uh, relationship status as a result. Because they were all, like... I think every anime thing he mentioned was a romance anime. The first one was about uh, two friends becoming lovers or something and sort of um, the slow process of that. I forget what fucking the name of the show when He doesn't have it written, on, uh, written down anywhere. Then he talks about this wonderful egg thing. Uh, something hatches from an egg or something. All the anime he recommended seemed cool, and I hadn't really heard about it at all. I think I'd heard this Wonder Egg name thing before. Um, but yeah, it seemed interesting that he was recommending a bunch of anime I hadn't heard of, even through, like, watching the, the anime's YouTube zeitgeist or whatever the fuck. Um, the last one was a movie, another ro- romance movie that seemed to, he seemed to tease, had, like, a melancholic end or something. Uh... I was kind of interested in all of those, but uh, will I follow through? Probably not. Then he starts talking about games, uh, and now there's this relationship uh, game again, where you it's like a turn-based duel thing that actually seems cool. Um, I don't play video games, though, so I'm probably not going to follow through on that one either, sadly. But again, it's just a recommendation machine of all this cool shit. Uh, what are we doing now? An Earthbound-type RPG thing. He talks about Spelunky 2. Um... 
Then he has a whole section about wrestling, of course. He talks about a bunch of matches I haven't seen yet. Oh, besides the Shingo, uh, Takagi, Jeff Cobb match at Wrestle Kingdom. That I really need to rewatch because I think I was half paying attention and everybody really likes that match. He's talking about Io Shirai versus Rhea Ripley. God, I love Io Shirai and I haven't watched a match of hers in a year because I haven't caught up on XT. Don't remind me of the existential dread of fucking the fact that I'll never catch up on wrestling. Ugh, but this EO Ripley match that's supposed to be really good. Oh, I love EO so much. Why don't I just watch her matches all the time? God, she's so cool. But fuck, I gotta catch up on that shit eventually. Now the Shingo Jeff Cobb match, and then he talks about the Eli Droganoff uh, Walter match uh, that I heard a lot of people talk about, but again, I haven't seen. But that I'm not gonna catch up on NXT UK, so I could just watch that match at any time. Maybe for the index thing we uploaded to the second channel. Then he has a big section about Brody Lee. Brody Lee died. Uh, good little uh, tribute here about all the good stuff he did in AEW that I haven't seen yet because I haven't caught up on AEW in a fucking year. Leave me alone. I hate wrestling more than I will hate anything. I got another ad, so uh, let's fucking procrastinate. In the next second, if I can skip it and see what he talks about after that. Then he talks about music he's into by a Chinese artist and then this weird documentary thing. Uh, and about how the pandemic is ruining everything because he's, he's I, like the last three videos of these, right? The whole of the last year. So the last four probably. He's had to mention the pandemic and all of them. Uh, and it ends with this weird, like, him losing his mind. Uh, he, he teases playing. Whenever he talks about the pandemic, he plays Come Sousa Todd from the end of Evangelion. Um, and he was teasing it throughout the video, and then he just lets it play at the end of the video as he does a weird outro where it's just him dancing in front of clouds. It's 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 one of those should-be-unfunny uh, bits that he's incorporated into his new videos, but it actually really lands. I like it. It's cute. Uh, I feel bad for people who have the coronavirus in their countries, because we really don't. <laughs> um, again, it's like six months ago, I went to a 50,000 people sports game. Uh, that was six months ago, and things have only really gotten better since then. Like, the rugby season is starting up soon, and like basically full crowds are expected for the entire season. Um, coronavirus is generally in the in the outer world seems to be going down like cases are down like 70 percent in america or some shit and they're fucking everything up so um it's like it was like this man i really feel bad for him but this is supposed to be like a like a thing that relates to everybody in the audience everybody in the audience is supposed to be together about this and how bad the last year has been or whatever and it's just like oh i feel unhuman where i'm supposed to like exactly relate to this but i really don't at all so that was kind of a weird bit of dissonance for me. Um, he has a cute little outro. He's telling everybody to take care of themselves, but it's not words. It's just text on the screen as he does the dance in the background as Come Caesar Todd plays and his patrons scroll past. I really like the... I think the ending of the, the video is really cute. Maybe he's trying to get it more experimental with his format. He might be bored of making uh, the similar type of content that he's really been making since he started his channel. I don't know. It was cute. I like that video a lot, uh, but it's only... Super Eye Patrol only makes it a number eight on the list because I think we're done talking about this stuff. Uh, it's cute. It's more Super Eye Patrol. You know what you're going to get. Okay, number seven. Tracing the Roots of Pop Culture Transphobia by Lindsay Ellis, February, tw- February the 23rd, 2021. Now, we're going to be a little negative here because I most of the things I have to say about this video are weird things that I don't really like about it. I think we should just say from the onset it is another Lindsay Ellis video. It's, it's very good. Um... In fact, it was the seventh best video of the week. Well, not really, because there's a bunch of doubles later on. But it's pretty good. Um, Where do we start? I haven't seen that many Lindsay Ellis videos, uh, which is important. Like, which ones have I seen? I watched the Borat one. For the one month, we didn't do anything relating to Digest. I thought that video was really good. Um, I don't know if it's just because I thought Borat was a super interesting concept that I had heard about but really didn't know anything about. I also watched the protest music of the Bush era, which I thought was really good too. This might be legitimately the third Lindsay Ellis. Oh, I watched the Game of Thrones ones a long time ago, but I didn't like those at all. So um, this might be like the fifth Lindsay Ellis video I've ever seen. Obviously, everybody knows who Lindsay Ellis is. Um, This one is all about tracing the roots of pop pop culture transphobia, uh, as it would indicate. Nearly had a million views already. She gets big views. This is tied into a ContraPoints video. Um where she sort of started off this topic. It's also another J.K. Rowling-type response thing. Um, And the the video that... I don't even think the video where uh, ContraPoints makes the Who Do You Think I Am Lindsay Ellis joke. Um, 
is even in the JK Rowling one. So I think it's like this video has been building for a while now. I think she only uploads over like three months or so. So it probably has been. But the basically, this is just talking about transphobia in like and how trans people are being represented in pop culture and sort of starting with we start we start with the framing by doing the jk rowling thing uh and talking about her trans uh manifesto thing she did and talking about generally why it's wrong and sort of the panic around trans people and then it starts talking about the history and like in the in a bunch of older movies like psycho and the science of the lambs like there's brief touchings on like gender bending and sort of how weird it is that's how it's framed and things like that um which is sort of like written off as not the best representation, but there's actually some lines in there that are kind of sensitive to the topic. Um, and it's sort of like, oh, it's just a wacky old thing. It's kind of disappointing that they handle these things in these ways, but these were like, I think Psycho is literally, in, it's like a 60s movie, right? It's, it's, it's in black and white. And Science of the Lambs is like a 70s movie, uh, I think. I don't know, don't quote me. I haven't seen either one of those films. Um and then it sort of gets into like the 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 nineties and the two thousands and sort of how everything has this puke joke in it and sort of how this is where the the representation becomes like actively bad, not just like oh it's a curious thing about weird transsexuals, but instead it's like oh they're the butt of the joke now. And then we tie it back into the J.K. Rowling thing and her book and how she portrays them and how it basically associates with the two decades of puking jokes. Um, and then concerns and the numbers, sort of fact-checking the trans issues, uh, and then talking about more modern stuff uh, and how it seems to be looking up as trans people are more in the film industry now and society is just generally more accepting. That's the outline of the video. Um, Now to talk about the things we had issues with, because this is one of the few videos I took notes on. Um, There's some frustrating aspects of this video, I write. Uh, but I felt this way about every Lindsay Ellis video I've seen so far where I don't uh, dislike, where I don't like how dismissive she is sometimes uh, while she she usually makes overall, she usually makes her overall points really well. Some of the littler points aren't explained uh, and are just assumed in, in what I think are harmful, harmful ways sometimes. This is awfully written. But fuck you, you have to listen. Um... The little points are harmful ways. The, the common sense is what I want to talk about. She has this big point about common sense at the beginning. She doesn't really. She just sort of dismisses it uh, and ju- just sort of says, like, most trans transphobic people are just appealing to common sense, and they talk about how it's common sense that biology is real or whatever the fuck. But she never really goes into why common sense is, like, a harmful, like, entity or, like concept and how it's just stupid and it's just like appealing to general sensibilities that aren't proven or aren't set in stone or or shouldn't be respected really and I've always hated this even since I was a little kid where teachers would talk about common sense I'd be like fuck you teacher you don't know shit um and like there's there's a really like I agree with her thing common sense is stupid she just doesn't really explain it and she doesn't I don't know if she even thinks common sense is stupid or she just thinks common sense is being applied wrongly here um Common sense is just terrible. It's just bad in every way. It's just an appeal to what everybody else thinks. It's an appeal to the general social, like, sensibilities of the time that will change and will always change and aren't necessarily, like, empirical or anything like that. It's just some stupid shit to, like, reinforce bad ways that things are already done. And I feel like there is an easy... Like, this is a pet peeve of mine, so maybe this just pissed me off. Like, there's a way to, like... You can attack this so much better than she does and sort of just writing it off. Um... Where I think she should have gone into it more and sort of explained why common sense arguments... Because you see it everywhere. It's just like everybody's favorite fucking thing to do is defend their stupid bullshit with common sense when they have no other arguments. And sort of breaking that down, I think, is very important. And she really doesn't. And this is, like, really important to, like, the first 10 minutes of the video and sort of talking about how all of the general, like, talking points against trans people appeal to this sort of common sense and why it's stupid and bad. I feel like we could have done that a little better, but... What else do I write down in these notes? Uh, she is right. 
She is right, appeals to common sense are poison, the very concept infuriates me, but she just laughs it off and doesn't explain why it's bad. There's also an instance of her making uh, fun of a vomit gag regarding the reveal of a, uh, of a woman that has a penis in movies. I don't think the vomit gag is exclusive to the trans reveal, so I think it's kind of disingenuous to try and make the scene seem unfunny and derivative rather than morally wrong and outdated. So there's two issues here that I actually do want to talk about. Um, she has a big thing about how for like 20 years there's just this trope of like when it's revealed in a funny way that haha the pretty girl that the the dude was talking to has a penis lamau and there's like this joke where everybody throws up uh, there's a south park reference in here from the one episode where uh cartman's mum is revealed to be a hermaphrodite and there's this big family guy joke where brian like pukes for like a minute on screen or something um there's a whole thing about this, and she sort of plays them all together to show like how how reductive, how like every how lazy of all these people to implement this idea when she backs it up like this consistent trope and like everything. Um, and I feel like this is kind of missing the entire point of the video, where it sort of it frames it first to be like, haha, they're all copying the same thing. That's not very funny because a lot of these things are supposed to be like they're, they're obviously jokes, right? It's supposed to be funny. Haha, you're just copying the joke. So there's there's already attack there where I don't think the vomit joke is just a trans joke it's usually just something disturbing and then you'd cut to a vomit gag like family guy's vomit gag is like there's like mass there's like a million other examples in family guy like one of the big like motifs in family guy is like the everybody vomiting scene I always thought that was fucking gross as a kid I don't like vomit but um like I don't know if this is necessarily exclusive to the trans thing though it does relate obviously she has a bunch of examples um so I don't think that was the best point. Also, there's always this... Whenever people talk about comedy, and ContraPoints talked about this when she talked about, like, bad trans jokes or whatever, and she talked about Ricky Gervais, which I think kind of misses the point. Uh, and I feel like everybody does this when they talk about comedy. Whenever somebody, like, whenever a joke is problematic, there seems to be this focus on talking about whether or not it's funny or not. And, like, it's an obvious thing. Everybody understands this. People make this joke understand this. But comedy is subjective, right? Whatever's funny is going to be funny to, an, to a person. And people try to read into things, like if you laugh at certain things, it sort of reflects an underlying like transphobia in you, in this case, or something like that. But I feel like the this is completely like pointless to the argument. Something can be funny and still be problematic and bad, and like morally bad. And I feel like people don't talk about this enough. Like, a vomit gag is can be funny, I guess. But, like, that's not what we're talking about. We're not judging in this video whether or not the comedy is funny when that when we're shitting on trans people or whatever. It's supposed to be about this being morally bad. But it's a very good optical, like, thing to be like, ha-ha, these things aren't... These aren't even funny. And to sort of, like, represent them in this way. Where that, like, it shouldn't matter if it's funny or not, right? That's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about it being bad. And, like, I feel like... This is just a massive, like, pet peeve I have when people talk about, like, stand-up comedy, where, like, like a bunch of woke people will talk about, like, a joke and, like, uh, attack a, a com comedian, and, like, some people will just say that it's unfunny and that's why it shouldn't be said. Because uh, that's a lot of people's stance on comedy, like, a lot of people that haven't ever thought out, like, offensive jokes or anything or what the stance should be. Like, I feel like I've heard Joe Rogan say this, like, he'll defend, like, a bad joke or a, or a racist joke or something and just say, but it's funny, and that's, like, the defense. Jokes are supposed to be funny, so if the joke is funny, then it's good and should be allowed. Or again, that's not really the conversation we're trying to have here, and we're sort of applying those rules to it, and it just seems stupid. Um, I should probably read how I lay this out in my notes. Uh, it seems like we are trying to win the optics game rather than the moral game here, which is fine, I guess. You need optics to convince people, but it doesn't really help the strength of the argument. Also, why is she... Oh, this is a different point, so I'm moving on there. So that's basically what I said just now. Um, you don't need to prove that it's not funny, because we're not really talking about that. And, and again, like, it's such a weak argument of just, like, well, it's not funny, and then somebody just has to say, well, I laughed, and then it, like, completely falls apart. Um... Also, why is she intentionally sounding disconnected sometimes? This is one of my least favorite YouTube tropes. I do get this weird vibe. I feel like I watched part of her talking about her book, and in that video she seemed very inspired. She was very here. She was very she was very here. She was very there. She was very engaged. Whereas it sort of seems like... I guess it's supposed to be part of a joke here about, oh no, we're talking about the J.K. Rowling trans stuff again. She sort of has this disconnected tone, which I feel like I would see in bad... It, like from It's like a trope from bad YouTube channels of sort of like... like almost like nostalgic ripoffs of like 
hmm, I don't really want to make this video, or whatever. I just don't like this as a YouTube trope. Like, if you're going to make a fucking video, at least seem like you're engaged with it. Um, it's not too bad. It's just sort of a general, like, I don't know, undertone of the video I get. Uh, this sounds like a very negative take on the video, but overall it's very good. ContraPoints was in it for three seconds. The research and understanding of media history makes the video valuable, plus the overall narrative uh, of the history of trans people in the series then it getting really bad in, the, in stories, then it getting really bad in the 90s and 2000s, with the pinnacle being framed around the J.K. Rowling novel, and then things generally looked up in the future. This was all good. Uh, we talked about that more at the start. Um, some of the fact-checking as the trans-talking sp- stuff was in there as well. So, yes, that was good. When she starts actually talking about, like, prison populations and sort of the uh, the concerns versus the numbers is how it's highlighted in the on the timeline with the timestamps. That, that part's good as well. So overall, I did have some problems with the video, but it's still number seven on the list. It's on the top ten list, and I liked all the videos before it, so (laughs) that should be an indication of, like, you should probably watch this video. Um, But is that all we had to say about that video? I think it is. We'll see the next Lindsay Ellis video. It'll probably be on this list again, and we can talk about it. But moving on, we've got number six. Everybody is into Twilight again by Sarah Z. This is the Sarah Z section. February the 2nd, 2021. And Tumblr's fakest story, the tale of... I don't even want to say it out loud. Upa Homeless Style uh, by Sarah Z. February 28th, 2021. Again, another very late month edition. Like, I was dreading having to watch, like, two and a half hours Sarah Z combined content in, like, after February had already ended. And I was like, oh, no, Digest isn't going to come out ever. Um, but we're here recording it much earlier in the month than we usually do. It's the third over here in my corner. Probably be like the fourth when this video comes out, but, uh, it's better than usual. Both these videos, no. One of these videos is really good, the other one is okay. I really like this Twilight video and the Tumblr's Fakers story thing. I think, uh, I've watched a good amount of Sarah's at this point. Um, she was featured a lot even on the first episode of Digest we ever did. Um, I think I've come down to the answer that I much prefer her content on, like, art-related stuff, so the Twilight video, rather than her weird internet history-type things. Um, I feel like the bad media criticism video was sort of the blend together of these two concepts, and I think it worked really well, but that's a lot older of a video of hers. But, like, I... It was cool while I was watching it. I wasn't having a bad time for the, uh, Tumblr video, but it's just sort of something that I have no connection to and I don't really care about at all. Um, I did miss these two, uh, what is this? Not Smallville, Supernatural, these two videos, and the author or whatever emailed me thing. I've missed most of her most recent one. I watched the YouTube tutorials one. Um, I haven't seen the JK Rowling one, the Stashcon video. She references Stashcon video a lot in the, the, uh, the Tumblr's greatest, uh, fake story or whatever, though I didn't watch that video. But whatever, we've seen a decent amount of Sarah Z. And I think I can come to the conclusion that I like her art stuff better than her weird internet history stuff. It all has a personal connection to her. She's doing what she knows, right? So it's not like change and talk about shit I want to like. It's just sort of my opinion, bro. But um, the Twilight video is very reminiscent, I think. I don't think it's as good, uh, even though it's placing higher on the list than the Vampire Diaries video by Jenny Nicholson did last month. But I think it is, it, it's like that type of video of sort of something I've never been into a, and I've just like heard about like the vampire diaries of Twilight I know these things exist uh but like it uh, about an hour and 20 minutes into this video I realized that I thought Edward and Jacob were different I thought they were the like the opposite I thought I can't I, now it's fucked up in my head that I don't even know what I originally thought and what the real version is but I know I used to think Jacob was Edward and Edward was Jacob um, so when she was talking about, like, which one the main girl ends up with, I thought she may ended up with the werewolf one, and I was like, oh, I didn't, I thought the vampire one was the main love interest, but I think she did end up with the vampire one, I don't know, I don't know the fucking plot to Twilight, leave me alone, um, but it's just a cool, like, internet history thing, it goes into the bad media criticism thing again about how, like, the internet shit on Twilight for a long time, and it was just, <laughs> it's just like a reminder that the internet has always been shit and full of morons, like, there was sincere, like, hatred for Twilight on, like, internet media circles until, like, 2014, I feel like. Like, Jeremy Johns, I'm pretty sure, made Twilight reviews and would, like, shit on them passionately, and it's like, oh my god, this is, like, 
Jeremy Johns, oh my god, holy shit, he's got a beard now, I haven't watched a Jeremy Johns video in three fucking years, One Division episode 8, my thoughts, Jesus Christ, he's getting some big v- views still as well, well, I guess he doesn't have any movies to cover now, right, nearly 2 million subscribers, I remember watching his videos in like 2013 when I was 12, and like his view- reviews, I feel like he was shitting on Twilight a lot, Chris Stuckman or whatever, I remember he had a video shitting on Twilight, and the stage critic obviously got famous shitting on Twilight, he was famous before that, but, like, that was a big thing, like, I remember, like, even the Amazing Atheist would make anti-Twilight videos or whatever, there was a lot of, like, actual, like, like, I feel like if this happened now, they would just be cringed out of existence, anybody that gave Twilight a second thought and would shit on it, um, it's just a funny bit of, like, the internet sincerely hated Twilight for a second, and that's unbelievably cringy. And it sort of reminds me of the thing, like, getting into, like, sort of Craft Dwarf, Vindy, What the What, Numanji videos, where they sort of go back and relook at, like, shonen, dra- like, like shonen anime and, like, Dragon Ball and Naruto and talk about how these series were actually good, and, like, the, the, the shitting on it the internet has done that's sort of ingrained in internet culture, and the talking points that are still brought up to shit on, like those types of stories that were aimed at children that we've sort of just memed on because now we're older and we're more mature and we don't like shit like that. And sort of how all those talking points are stupid and that people just didn't look at it at all fairly and it was completely bad faith bullshit or terrible critiques that are just good for memes, basically, to, like, shit on something jokingly. Because if you can make something funny to like, then nobody nobody wants to jump on that bandwagon. And now it's sort of the role reversal, right? Now things are coming out. Now we've got Defense of Twilight videos and sort of like everybody understanding how stupid it was at the time to shit on it and sort of how that wave has gone away. And now it's the sort of like with a good faith, like not like more reserved, mature, I guess, tone to go back and look at Twilight. And this video isn't really like that big of a Defense of Twilight she sort of admits that it is kind of bad, but, like, it's not nearly as bad as, like, a lot of other shit that came out at the time, um, I don't know, it just goes through all the layers of, sort of, the fandom that I was just not aware of at all, and it's fascinating to me to, like, learn, just like the Vampire Diaries video again last month, of just, like, learn what this thing that people around me used to talk about a lot was like, because I feel like when I was, like, I, she talks about how, like, the movie came out in 2008, the first one, so I would have been seven. I feel like nine-year-old me was talking about how much he hated Twilight or something, pissing off girls in primary school or some shit. I feel like that's something I probably did at some point. I don't have any memories of it specifically, but it had to have happened. Uh, Just like One Direction or whatever at the time, being like 10 when that shit was going on, and being like, haha, girls are stupid, they're obsessed with this dumb love shit. Um, That's sort of the... (laughs) It's funny, because that like 11-year-old, not even 11, like 9, 10-year-old perspective seems to have been reflected in a lot of grown adults on the internet at that time, which is kind of alarming. But again, that's kind of the point of the video talking about how stupid all that seemed um there's a lot of uh, there's underlining political stuff in here which uh, i'm good with i like it's not a negative but like the stuff about like people irrationally hating shit that teenage girls like which seems to be a very prevalent thing in pop culture uh to shit on things teenage girls like more than anything else like things that teenage boys like you sort of laugh off as edgy or they even get some serious like uh treatment or whatever whereas like teenage girl stuff is like laughed off and sort of it is a lot of female youtubes like jenny nicholson with the vampire diaries thing and now sarah's there with 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 twilight like people who are actually there now that are older that can actually give proper perspective on it um she has a big thing about like the sparkling vampire thing and how it's like very homophobic and things like that um and sort of makes fun of batman and how people didn't think uh the dude who played uh i don't know which one it is now um, Robert Pattinson, I think is his name, um, how he couldn't play Batman because Batman isn't a sparkling vampire and sort of making fun of people for thinking Batman is this esteemed sort of thing, uh, and sort of comparing it to Twilight in that regard of like, Batman is a thing teenage boys are into, so it's supposed to be respected and this man can't play fucking Batman. Batman's a real man or whatever. And sort of making fun of that. Um, also Robert Pattinson is the lead in Good Time, which he mentions at some point here, uh, and I had to do a double check, and I had to Google it, and I was like, holy shit, I didn't even know that was the dude, because obviously I've seen Harry Potter, so I know he's Cedric Diggory in that, and I knew he was in Twilight, he was the main boy, and I knew he was Batman recently, that, there was a trailer for that Batman movie, did that get cancelled or whatever, is that still scheduled to come out, is it just delayed because of the pandemic or some shit, I remember seeing a trailer for that or whatever, um, but I haven't heard anything about it since, I'm not 
very into the superhero shit right now, so I might just be behind on the fucking news. But again, this is all interesting stuff. What was I going on about? Oh, he was the lead in Good Time. I fucking couldn't believe that. I haven't thought about that movie in like two years. That was a good meme. Um, but yeah, I was going through and there was a point I was building up to there. But I can't fucking remember what it was and I lost my train of thought. And that's not news to anybody that's watched these videos. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail about a bunch of shit that I think is fascinating. And like, whoa, I didn't know any of this shit about any of this shit. And it's kind of cool. Like, you have cultural context clues of certain things you've heard about uh, and sort of tying that into and putting it in more of like a timeline of what the Twilight experience actually was like and how in 2018 it sort of had a renaissance and uh, things going on. It's just an interesting timescape, you know? These girls, they're weird creatures. And to get the mindset of sort of what Twilight was all about, because it is very directed at, at a female audience, it's like, hmm, isn't that interesting? What the fuck was all that about? Uh, when you're not a, an 11-year-old anymore talking about how girls drool or whatever the fuck. Um... Then the Tumblr one, do we have anything else to say about this one? Uh, it goes into a bit about the skeptics. I feel like every Breadtube video comes back to the skeptic community somehow. And uh, it's not necessarily a critique, because it kind of <laughs> did ruin everything about everything. But, uh, yeah. Just talking about uh, fake people making fake, fake stories, and it becomes a convoluted fucking mess at the end. And it's, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting tale from the internet that I probably won't forget anytime soon. It just, I don't think it's as engaging. I didn't really have any context clues for this. So, uh, I like t Twilight, so it was sort of like a deep dive into this thing for an hour and five minutes I know nothing about. Uh, I don't really know anything about Reddit history or Tumblr history, so what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? But it was fun nonetheless. Um, we'll keep up with Sarah Z moving forward. Uh, we always had the intent to. I just didn't get to watch those Supernatural videos. I wonder if I missed out on any golden content there. But uh, I'd prefer, I, I want more uh, media ones. I want another Twilight video about something else like that. That would be what I would want moving forward. But uh, fuck it. She can do what she wants. Um, but I think that's all we have to say about those videos. It's cute. I like going back into... I feel like the Vampire Diaries video, I underrate a lot. Because I think about that video a lot. And just how good it was. And sort of... It's not as funny. I don't think Sarah Zed has, like, the stage presence that a lot of her uh, bread tube contemporaries do. Like, I... I don't know. The Lindsay Ellis presence was kind of pissing me off in that video, so I was like, eh, I'd take, it over, I'd take the Sarah Z presence over the Lindsay Ellis one. But she doesn't have, like, the contra points, obviously, the gravitas and the charisma there. Um, who was the fourth option? I was... Ah, oh, the Jenny Nicholson charisma that we talked about last time. I don't think she quite has that, so I don't think the video is as engaging. Jenny Nicholson is, like, really funny. Um, I don't think comedy is a big aspect of, like, the Sarah Z videos. Um, so it sort of makes it more engaging. So, I, again, I probably like the Vampire Diaries video a lot more, even though it was, like, nine on last week's list on these ones. These ones were good, too. It's more of that ilk, I think. Um, Miller was talking to me about the fucking gag where, like, an hour after she's done talking about racism, Jenny Nicholson finds the fucking post-it note for <laughs> racism under the character's name, and it was like, God, it was a good gag, right? And it was really good. And I, underrate, I underrated that video. Um, but that's it for that. Let's move on to number five. I was begging that this video would be fucking 30 minutes long, but we're already an hour in and we're only at number five. Ah, fuck. Five, we've got Dunky. And now I was, I was thinking about where to put these. Two Dunk Views reviews came out. Dunk Views, which are Dunky Reviews. Get it? The, the fucking words are put together. I just rewatched the fucking Super Mario 3D World, which is the first video we're going to talk about. Then the Bowser Fury one. Let me, let me say exactly when they came out. I did this fucking email for note for something. February the 11th, 2021 for the 3D world, and then Bowser's Fury was February 17th. I rewatched the 3D world one, like, right before I came out to the car. Uh, God, it was good. You can just sit there and you're like, oh, it's over. You just want more. The dunk views are really good. It's better than the gameplay videos. It's so dense with, like, cool shit. Creative, like, <laughs> post-modern ways to make points. Um... It's funny, because I criticized the Lindsay Ellis video for the optics argument. Now, obviously, this is about games and not political transphobia and things like that. So I think she should be held to a better standard. But that's like the whole dunky aesthetic is sort of like these weird and like... Like, I remember there's a part in the... God, all these videos are so good. You're just going to smile while you're watching the whole thing. They breeze past in 30 seconds. You know, you've seen fucking dunky videos before. The narrative voice is outstanding. The narration is outstanding. The fucking footage tied to it is fucking always working. It's just overall... Like, he's got it down to a science. They're fucking perfect videos, nearly. Um, 
the um there's a part I was talking about the optics argument. There was a part in um in the three D world video where he's talking about um the cat suit and how fucking cool it is and all this shit. Uh, and he talks about like and you asking why there's elevators on the walls or whatever, which is specifically for the cat powers. It's very contrived for the the mechanics of the game. And like the joke, he he like angrily whispers like, "Don't you ever ask those questions." And it's just like a great hit on like it doesn't matter why. Like I could see like again like a nostalgic critic type fucking YouTuber making a big fuss about them. Makes no sense that these elevators are on the walls just for the convenience sake of Mario. Like these like talking about how contrived the levels are because that makes it bad because it was. Just just designed to Mario to get through them, or something like have this narrative dissonance there. And it's just like shut the fuck up, moron, and we're just moving forward. And it's like a great way to like, because it works on so many levels. It's fucking gag. It's just like uh, it's it doesn't even make that point, but it begins to make that point to make you register that point. But maybe you don't. And maybe most viewers just walk past and don't even understand the joke. But I registered it because I'm a smart viewer. And then, like, for him to just dismiss the talking point with like this underlying joke that doesn't actually address the point because the point is so obvious. It's just like an intrinsic joke that you shouldn't have to explain, and it's less funny when you explain it, but it fucking works, and it hits so well. And I just want to listen to it over and over. Talking about fucking clear pipes, he's running through it. He talks about this ain't no pussy game, because, like, the game throws, like, more ideas at you in the first two hours uh, than, like, most AAA games do in 60 hours. And talking about how cool Mario games are designed and things like that. It's so fucking good. Getting across the passion, him doing the music thing, him doing the music mumble along memes where he's like, this is my jam, and then he mouths the fucking instrumental. It's always fucking co- comedic uh, fucking gold. It's always quality shit. It's just so good. What what else is there to fucking say, really? You have to watch these videos. Uh, they're so good. Did Dunkey come out with anything else this month with their other meme videos? <laughs> Six million subscribers as I live and breathe. Ah, uh, yes, there was the shadowy organization behind Groundhog's Day, something or other. This was just a meme donkey video. The Donkey Direct. Did I not watch this video? I might not have. No, I think I did, because he talked about how the Direct was disappointing, right? Yeah, I think I watched that one. So those two videos came in as well. But Dunk Views are more a scripted actual video, so I feel like they're more appropriate for the digest format. Um... The Bowser's Fury one, I didn't rewatch right before this, so I don't remember exactly what was said. Um, he talks about how he really likes it and how it's sort of this new approach for the series and how it's going forward and it's not uh, the next big Mario game and it's short, but it's like an indication of where we're going and it's super cool and it uses um, sort of the 3D world uh, type stuff and creative in new ways and all the good stuff. He talks about it being good. I wish I, I should have rewatched this one too. I'm going to rewatch this right after I get out of this fucking car. In fact, I'm probably not even going to leave the car. I'm going to leave this tab fucking open so I can rewatch this. I just scrolled through and there was this Tony Soprano meme in there somewhere. It's just donkey shit. He's hitting on all cylinders. Both these videos are so good. Um, the passion, the the narration, the narrative voice. We talk about all the same things every time. He's got this shit down to a science. It's great stuff. There's not really more to elaborate on. These are two five-minute videos. They're incredibly fucking dense, though, as they always are. I just can't remember specific points that much. Because they're so dense. But all is good in the world of donkey videos. We're out of the uh, meme phase where he's making Drama Tuesday videos or whatever the fuck. We're on the real shit now. Dun- two dunk views in a month. That's some good shit. Um, but that's it. Let's move on to number four. We've got Kraftstorf with three videos since we're counting the latest fairy tale one as a February video because for the most of the for the majority of the world, I think it did come out in February, even though here it's listed as March first, twenty twenty one. Um, first, I want to live my favorite moment in fiction, Kraftstorf, uh, February the seventh, two thousand twenty one. Uh, Greed is Good, Kraftstorf, uh, February uh, 26th, no, 16th, 2021, regarding fairy tales, magic, and ladies, part two of the overly long tirade on the overly long tirade, Kraftstorf, March 1st, 2021, on March 28th. Um, these videos are good. I kind of regret watching the first two. Like, I'm nearly at I'm nearly at Water 7. Obviously, I know all the stuff. I've seen the I Want to Live clip a bunch of times. I've seen Robert's backstory a bunch of times. I know... The, the, they show up and kill everybody. I know about Tom dying. So nothing was really spoiled for me uh, in the One Piece video. But it's like, I don't really want the context. But I have to watch the Crystal video. The Crystal video just came out. Um, it's weird that he gets, like, equivalent to my views. Like, this Greed Island video only has 4,000 views. Um, 
and the I Want to Live Big One Piece video only has 5,000 views. I guess crossover videos just accumulate views, like, um, over time, I guess, because a lot of his bigger videos have, like, 30,000 views, I feel like, on all of them. Uh, sometimes you get crossed off as a bigger YouTuber, but crossed off appeal is here in all of these videos. Oh, I was going to talk about because I was talking about getting spoiled on shit. So in the Nico Robin one, it didn't really spoil. I was scared. The Greed Island video definitely spoiled me on a bunch of shit. I know which Phantom Troop members Cora Pika kills now. I kind of regret knowing that. Uh, the boob girl and um, the muscly dude. Uh, and then I sort of know how the next two arcs resolve. Uh, it sort of dampened my spirits to get get back into Hana Hana since I... Uh, what was I on? Episode 31 or so. We had just started. I was very excited for the York New Arc or whatever. I'm still very excited for that. Greed Island, it's sort of like... Uh, now I kind of know. Um, the Greed is good. I don't know if I entirely got the point of this video again. I should probably watch all of Hana Hana first. Talking about hunters needing desires and certain things like that. Um... It seems to be a good prevailing theme in how far people go and sort of pure motivations for things and character characters relating the themes, and he talks about all that. I don't really want to talk about that. All of these videos are basically big cross off videos. There's a lot of thematically dense analysis, uh, a lot of... Uh, it's just the cross off stuff. You know what it is. We've talked about it a million times. It's very well written. I like the way in which it's narrated. Um... Just, uh, you, you, the, you, what you come to cross with videos for is not really the aesthetic, it's not really the cult of personality, it's very much more the content of the video and the thematic analysis of what is being talked about. Um, obviously, this I Want to Live one is all about Nico Robbins' character arc uh, in Water 7, and sort of her decision to wanting to live. He talks about what living means in One Piece, and uh, people... Uh, describe life and how they live in certain things like that it's a bunch it's really it's always really dense you, i would really need to rewatch this video right before it to talk about it in de details but i didn't take any notes for these craft store videos um it's just the best stuff uh for these first two videos it's just general good craft store stuff um it'll make you think about things you've never thought about even if you've seen these series like three times i feel like it's dense thematic like analysis with good points. Uh, in the Hunter Hunter video, because this was one of the points I did get, he talked about something I hadn't noticed at all, which was about how Gon learns how to get his Soka's badge by learning to observe sort of this fish, fly, hawk, him dynamic of sort of the food chain, and that everything has something it desires, and once you understand what people want, it's easy to predict their behavior and sort of get what you want out of it, and then how this sort of relates directly to what happens afterwards, where uh, he attacks something, and then, and then, like, the bug dude attacks him, and then Hisoga attacks him, and sort of how he didn't, like, he was, he didn't learn the lesson entirely because he made them the same mistake, and sort of how the analogy with the bird, the fish, and the, the fucking fly is replicated in the events that happen right afterwards, and it's not really spelled out to the viewer. Again, I thought that was a really cool, dense detail that explains, like, why Hunter Hunter is really, really good, um that I hadn't thought about, and I'd seen that shit, so I can't even use the excuse that I didn't even, I hadn't seen it yet, um, the, the I Want to Live video is playing through right now, uh, there's a quote about Law talking about, uh, the weak don't get to choose how they die and certain things like that, and how that's kind of reflected in One Piece, it's real cool, it's just like a bunch of thematic elements that he ties into it, which makes a very interesting fucking video to watch, but the big video I want to talk about, uh, is the fairy tale video, now, Krausdorf has done the thing, we talked about this kind of with the Sarah Z Twilight video, of going back through fairy tale, something he used to shit on a lot, that's what sort of made his name on YouTube, I believe, and sort of going back and reviewing his old videos, and talking about how bad they were, and sort of the terrible critiques he used to have, that a lot of people, like, a lot of people still use the points made in that video to shit talk for fairy tale, or just generally they use similar types of criticism to critique a bunch of shit they don't like and it's always stupid as fuck it's always dumb it's bad criticism born from like the internet that was like acceptable in 2015 and is still very widely accepted today as sort of this bad type of criticism i wish i could give more specific examples but sort of about world building and how like there are no rules to art he talks about art essentialism a bunch in this video a bunch of cool shit like that um and sort of talking about how he engaged with, in bad faith with a lot of the content here. Um, it's very interesting to go back and see, like, he's literally critiquing his old videos. Um, 
And it's funny because a lot of his audience has an identity with hating on fairy tale. So him coming out talking about how all the points they parroted that he made back in the day are all stupid and they're stupid for repeating them just like he was stupid for making them originally and them sort of having a meltdown about how like hating fairy tale became part of their identity just like people who used to hate on Twilight it became part of their identity to shit on this thing that other people liked and you viewed the people that liked it as lesser and worse than you and sort of this overall... Like, I like the fact that now people are becoming more self-aware and sort of, like, looking back on old shit and being like, that was real fucking stupid the way we used to think about things. And people still think about things um, and sort of going back and analysing, like, remember the idiots that used to shit on Twilight relentlessly, like the grown adults that used to shit on Twilight in 2000 and fucking 9? That was dumb as fuck. Let's talk about it and why all the shit they used to say was wrong, even though you probably used to agree with a lot of that shit. Again, this is basically what's happening with fairy tale here. If there is a Twilight equivalent in the fucking shonen anime community it's fairy tale everybody loves to shit on fairy tale um sort of going back with a good faith look and seeing like actually shit was going down here it's just sort of proof that people on the internet don't know shit about what they're fucking talking about and they never have and uh at least some people are trying to think that they will now Uh, because the logical progression of that sentence is and they never will but it seems like people are trying now and it's like this is some good shit and i like it a lot um And again, him sort of honestly thematically analyzing what's going on with these characters and sort of pointing out how, like, these journal critiques are bad. Uh, He has, he points out the hard work critique here that's in a lot of shonen thing, especially with the Rock Lee shit and people criticizing Naruto for that dumb shit and how he used to do it to fairy tale and sort of bring up the Vegeta example of Vegeta who trains harder than Goku, isn't as strong as Goku because he isn't emblematic of the theme being portrayed through Dragon Ball. And sort of a lot of people would critique, oh, Dragon Ball's not fair because Vegeta trains harder and he doesn't win. Not understanding that the entire point of this series is that Vegeta only wants to be the best because he wants the pride of being the best because he thinks he should be the best because he's the prince of all Saiyans. And how that's intrinsically a bad thing to just want to be the best for the best sake. Whereas Goku wants to be the best to test himself and have fun fighting and protect the people he loves so obviously Goku ends up being the stronger of the two um, and Vegeta takes forever to learn these lessons right initially it's family doesn't go all the way and by the end of DBZ he sort of accepts with Goku and becomes friends and all that sort of stuff sort of talking about how these dumb talking points like that would get repeated about how it's not fair Vegeta should be stronger because he trains harder when it's just ignoring what thematically is going on this is very literal realist he talks about realism a lot in this video as well and realism is like everybody hates realism at this point but everybody still uses realism to critique things talking about how like um unrealistic it is for certain people and and how you never like. I think he talks about how he used to say that the fact that they never get pers- the perspective of the non-magical people in fairy tale was dumb, even though obviously the interesting part is the magic, and that's basically the thematic, like container for the whole show to operate in. So obviously you follow a bunch of mages, uh, and it goes through a, a bunch of cute shit like that. There is an interesting point again. Miller pointed this out um, where Krustorf explains why dragons are used to fight dragons in Japanese culture. This is another big like uh, like Krustorf advantage is he likes to look at things from more of a Japanese perspective, which a lot of people in the Western anime community seem to like. Like people shitting on reincarnation as a concept when like that's obviously a massive piece of like uh, Japanese culture. And uh, I forget Buddhism or Shintoism. Those are two big uh, Shintoism. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, those are the two big uh, religions in Japan, right? And one of them, reincarnation, is, like, a massive thing. So, obviously, it's just in a lot of their, like, general cultural context. So, obviously, it's going to be reflected in, like, their media and in shonen media aimed at kids, right? And a lot of Western people, especially in, like, Naruto and things like that, they always critique, like, and this reincarnation shit is so dumb and whatever. And it's sort of like, well, you don't understand, like, the cultural context this comes from and what, re- like, reanimation... Reanimation? Did I say reanimation? What am I actually trying to say? Reanimation is a fucking jutsu in Naruto. And we're not talking... Reincarnation. Um, and talking about how, like, it means a different thing in Japanese culture. And here he explains why dragons in Japanese culture are usually used to fight dragons, which is a thing in fairy tale. And then he relates it to Pokemon, because in Pokemon, dragon... Obviously, Pokemon is a Japanese franchise. Dragon is super effective against dragon. It's one of the only types that's super effective against itself, because in Japanese mythos, you need to use a dragon to fight a dragon. Um... You have to use dragon weapons to fight dragons. That was a cute little point in there that I liked a lot. But again, going against the realism thing... Um, he talks about the sexuality of the girls a little bit in here. Um, it's a bunch of good shit. I really like this fairy tale video. I, even though I haven't seen fairy tale, I feel like it's more 
because maybe just because I'm probably never going to watch or read fairy tale, um, and I'm actively going through One Piece and Hunter Hunter right now, so I was sort of like more hesitant to watch those videos and be like, uh, I don't want to, I don't want, I kind of want to figure this out for myself. Uh, whereas fairy tale, I just, it's interesting. Again, it's an literally a, a response video to his own videos, tearing them apart. It's really cool. I, it's like a retraction thing. I seek to try and do retractions on my older videos too. Uh, I've done them for like two videos and I'll put a pinned comment about all the shit I got wrong in a video. I really need to get back on that. Um, cause I haven't done one of those in like two months. So it's good. Keeping yourself consistent is another massive, like positive here. Um, I don't know. Craft store videos are good. I feel like the fairy tale video. I like when he talks. I think I like when he talks about wider topics more than like specific character examples. Uh, like maybe with that Robin video. Like when he talks about like general story critiques. I feel like this is what I like a lot of his podcast material as well. With um with all his his group there, like Vindy and, and what the what, and Imanji and Mathwiz and all those people. Um, I like more when they talk about general issues they have with the way people talk about art online rather than when uh, rather than when they're specifically talking about things they like or don't like. Um, I usually find that they're my favorite type of content and that's more what the the fairy tale videos are. Like it's a bunch of specific talking points rather than just like a thematic an- analysis of, of Robin's character or whatever. Um, because I like talking about art critique more than art, maybe. Maybe that's where we're going. But yes, that's the Craftsdorf videos. I feel like I, had, I said everything I wanted to say there. Uh, everybody should be watching Craftsdorf, especially if they're into shonen anime stuff. And at number three, we've got Geek Evolution here with three parts of one superhero rewind, which is Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice Part 1, 2, and 3, February 13th, 2021, February 20th, 2021, February 27th, 2020, 2020, 2021. Easy for me to say. Um, all coming out a week after each other with a consistent schedule. If only we could replicate this man's genius. And this isn't even the end of it. So he's done three hours so far on Batman vs. Superman. Uh, Superhero Rewind we talked about at number 10 last week. Uh, last month, rather, when I finally got back into the Geek Evolution Superhero Rewind series. Um, I've watched so many Superhero Rewinds, like on the backlog since then. I watched the Avengers one, the Avengers Age of Ultron one. Everybody should watch his Avengers Age of Ultron one. I think it's a lot of interesting stuff about that movie that people don't really talk about. People like write off that movie as like the bad one. Uh, I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theatre, so I don't know if it's good or bad, but just the thematic take he has on it and sort of how Ultron, Tony Stark, and Vision all play off each other thematically is super interesting. Uh, a bunch of his X-Men stuff, I watched that too. I just watched a bunch of his stuff uh, in the backlog. Now, these videos are just still shots and then sort of a podcast audio, so you can sort of watch them, uh, listen to them while you're doing shit. That's why I don't... This is like this in the Five Nights at Freddy's video earlier. I don't know if they entirely fit like the analysis video slash video essay structure superhero rewind used to just be a superhero rewind which is the series this is a part of which is a, an initiative to try and review every single superhero movie by evolution here um what was i saying before that before i went off that fucking road Oh, whether or not, like, Superhero Rewind as a series used to just be a video essay. They used to be editing and everything, but now he's opted to, in order to get them out more quickly, he's just not going to edit them, and he's going to put them out as basically podcasts. The, the still images he has on all of these are really cool, though. I like them. Um, they're well-designed thumbnails and fucking still images. Man, I wish I could do this for all my videos. No editing, just a still image and a thematic point and a big analysis. That would be fucking sick. So I'm very envious of this man because I hate editing. It's the worst thing in the world. Um, Batman vs Superman came out in 2016. I feel like it came out like 2014. Um, Batman vs Superman is a historically memed on movie that everybody hates. Uh, it's like one of the, the regarded as one of the worst superhero movies of all time. It's a big meme, the Martha meme, all that stuff. Batman killing people. It's sort of a good faith dive into what works and doesn't work uh, in this movie, and it's not a very positive one. Unlike Age of Ultron, where people kind of shit on that movie, where he had a very positive take on it. Um, this is more of a negative drive. But it's a very good faith negative drive of trying to understand what the fuck is supposed to be going on in this movie. He's talking specifically about the director's cut of this movie um, and all the added details that are in there. So the thematic ideas it's trying to structure with. He talks about uh, watching the Zack Snyder like commentary of the thing and what Zack Snyder thinks he's making versus what's actually on screen and sort of um, comparing them and, and things like that. Again, this is three hours. I don't know if I can go into... Um, 
all the different points he makes. Superhero Rewind is like required viewing, I think, for a well-written, good faith engagement with material that I admire a lot. Um, I really like the narration. We talked about all this last time, the way he narrates the scripts, the passion sort of in his voice. Um, yeah, I just like the way the way he writes and thinks about things, and I think it's valuable, especially when these, like, super, uh, Greek Evolution has never been a really big, like, it's not a seminal, like, piece of analytical YouTube history, like Red Letter Media's Palinkit reviews are, whereas I think they're as foundational to me in what I think about things. It really is my version of those fucking Plinkett reviews, because I really didn't watch the Plinkett reviews until, like, 2016 or whatever, um, when I was already into a bunch of video essay shit. Uh, it really is superhero rewind is like my foundational thing because I watched these when I was like eleven because I was really into superhero shit back then. Um, sort of the first thing that opened me to sort of thematic ideas and, and things like that with his old Dark Knight superhero rewind and things like that. So it is required viewing for me. Like part one is called Granny's Peach Tea, which it goes on, like I think part one is all about what the it's like the general things of the movie and sort of summarizing all of the major points you'll go into in the next two hours. Um, and sort of, like, how the movie nearly has good ideas, but then they completely fall apart in a bunch of different ways, uh, like Granny's Peach Tea and sort of the allegory there with the fucking piss thing or whatever and the explosion and things like that. And then he does something he doesn't usually do for part two and part three, where he actually goes through chronologically and talks about every scene in the movie. Actually, I think he stresses that it's not every scene, but just about every scene, um, and sort of talks about how idiosyncratically everything kind of falls apart and where things don't really work um like part two is called the metahuman thesis and sort of about how lex's plan just doesn't make sense it's a bunch of bullshit that the movie tries to convince you makes sense but it really doesn't and like it contradicts itself at all angles and what lex is actually trying to do and all this weird stuff and then part three is Superman was never real, where he talks about how he hates the Superman in this movie and how Superman is all gloomy. He brings it back to Watchmen a lot and sort of how Zack Snyder also made Watchmen and how this kind of is trying to be Watchmen at times and is also failing just like the Watchmen movie failed. I haven't seen any Watchmen anything, so I don't know if any of that's true. But um, sort of going through all of that, it's just a very well laid out, like, I don't know what else to say. I can't go into specifics really here. It's just like, everybody should be watching Superhero Rewind. He spent all of last month on this. He expected it to only be three parts, but it's turned into four parts. It's supposed to come out before the the Justice League Snyder Cut comes out, so it can sort of be this historical, like, piece of this is what people thought about Batman vs Superman before its sequel actually came out. When it comes out, I don't even know when it comes out. I'm not exactly anticipating it. I didn't even see the original cut of Justice League. Um, but yeah, so it's just sort of like, it's supposed to be this piece, like this pin in what we thought about it before then and whether or not some of the things that are promised in Batman Superman are actually paid off in the Snyder Cut of Justice League, whereas I think they were all just thrown out for the actual cut of Justice League that came out. And sort of, I'm a yawny motherfucker today. Fuck me. Um, and sort of how it plays into things. I think it's very interesting. I think this should be, like, required viewing for everybody. Uh, all the superhero ruins really should be. I'm working my way back through the back catalogue. Oh, I'm trying at least as well. But that's really all I got to say about fucking Superhero Rewind and Geek Evolution in our number three plot on the list. It's just... I think also a TMNT versus Batman Superhero Rewind also came out this month um, in February, but I didn't watch that one. I only watched the Batman vs. Superman ones. They're the ones I'm recommending here. Jesus Christ, we've been linking on for an hour and a half. We've only got two videos left. Now we're down to two. The Liberal Escapism of Bridgerton by Broey D. Chanel. Uh, a common favorite here on digest this video came out on february the 14th 2021 i think i came to the realization that she's the best bread tuber and the realization is that she put liberal in the title and the video wasn't complete dog shit uh and wasn't just shitting on meme neoliberalism from like twitter or some shit it was actually talking about what liberalism means and the faults of it and how it's reflected in bridgerton and i couldn't fucking believe it if you see a bread shoe video with liberal in the title it ain't gonna be good chief but this one was actually good. She also came out with a Q&A video that I watched last night, so that was nice. That was more personal. It doesn't really belong in any digest, plus it came out in March, so it wouldn't be. But uh, Bridgerton is a big name. The only reason I know what Bridgerton is is because on all the porn reddits I go on, they talk about Bridgerton all the time. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, for, I've all, all the, Everything I know about it is that there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, graphic, intimate sex scenes. 
um, that people like a lot on the porn reddits and everything I've inferred from watching this video particularly. Um, so I don't really have any opinions on Bridgerton, so I can't really think. But this video is all about performative wokeness and individuals that can't change systems. Now, the actual ideal of liberalism is more this idea of individualism, right? That individuals can change things. And, like, focusing on yourself is kind of more important. Um, she goes through this... Uh, I think No, was this in an Innuendo Studios video where he talked about this? Or does she talk about this in the video? Sort of like this idea of, like, of like slightly left-wing thought, like very center-left thought of, like, individuals and overcoming racism and being good to people and how that can change things. Sort of this personal responsibility type leftism and how this has been... This is liberalism, basically, right? Um, and how it, like, fails to uh, address systematic issues. Of I, I, I said this in the Just Right response video we did on the main channel um, about uh, how... I, I use the example of, right, if every cop wasn't racist, the police force would still be a racist institution, right? Because there are racist policies that even if every police officer loved black people uh, and didn't harass them at all, there would still be racist policies that uh, give them quotas or over-representation in, in, like, black areas and things like that. It's sort of like this liberal escapism that, like, a good person, like, if, if the head of police was a good uh, non-racist person, that er they could change everything just by setting an example. Like, is apparently done in, done in Bridgerton, where the reason why there are black people in, like, this English setting in the 1800s and they're tr not treated with any regard for racism uh, is because uh, this old white man fell in love with a, with a black woman or something, and there's there's a scene where like one of the black characters says that love can conquer all, and that's sort of the 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 theme that's kind of being embodied, and sort of how this kind of neglects the entire point of like, uh, like what these how to change things in these sorts of ways. Um, because that's one of the selling points of Bridgerton, right? Was that um, she has this this uh, concept where she talks about that one of the producers and her colorblind uh, casting type choices, where she worked on a is it Grey's Anatomy? It was it's one of the hospital dramas uh, where like she she was head of casting or whatever, and it was basically. Um, there were lots of uh, diverse casting and that type of thing, and then there are sort of more critiques about how this is kind of missing the point of why representation matters or whatever of about like pretending that these race issues don't exist and just putting black people in positions of power without addressing racism at all sort of um neglects sort of the 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 black identity or the black struggle in sort of car in sort of these these areas and things like that um it's sort of a diff it's got like it's not a, like a bad faith takedown of this it's like this is an idea of how to fix, like, the lack of diversity in media or whatever, right? Is what if we just say fuck it and we don't have to... We just cast black people and white people and Asian people all equally um, uh, and just, like, hope that that fixes things. Whereas it sort of misses the reasons and misses addressing the reasons why these issues exist in the first place. And I'm just trying to correct them. Um, she talks about Disney at the end and about how Disney, like... Like, Lindsay Ellis has a whole video about this that I actually haven't seen. But, like, the fake wokeness and sort of talking about how, like, Disney just sort of acts like its racist history doesn't exist. They don't really, like, apologize it outright. Or if they do, they will just, like, give an apology and not really do anything about it. Like, the racist character, character caricatures in, like, early 30s movies. And that's a point she gets into eventually. Um, what else is there really to say? I'm sort of hitting a brick wall here. Um... What else is said in this video? There's a lot of stuff about sort of batting back and explaining that, like... Like, just having... Just casting black people in this role is sort of a liberal escapism. That's the whole point of the title, right? Um, and it's not actually true to life or anything like that. Uh, fuck, I felt like I was building up to a bigger point, but I've completely gone off. And now there's a fucking Subway commercial on my stupid fucking computer screen, so I can't scroll through the goddamn timeline. And now we're getting a second ad! Well, fuck me. Maybe I should get ad block like chat yells at me continuously for. Um, 
We're showing a lot of third world. Oh, and now she's talking about volunteerism or volunteerism or whatever. Where, like, the, uh, um, how, like, volunteer things sort of reflect this and where, like, white people can go over and get very attached to, like, one, like, poor, impoverished kid and, like, sponsor them uh, and sort of, like, help that one kid out. But it's sort of missing the issue of how these people got into this place in, like, third world countries where they don't have enough food or water or whatever. And we're sort of ignoring that just to, like... Because ads like that, they, like, target your empathy, right? And try to get you to be like, look at this kid. You can help this kid out and sort of, like donating to just this one kid isn't actually going to fix the issue or the reason it's just going to create more kids like that and sort of how we have to address systematic issues systemic issues and things like that um to fix these issues and it's sort of pretending um like these issues like this is fixing these issues when it's really missing the entire point the question of history is a segment of the video, uh, which, ah, oh, and she brings up this point of how the, the um, series is also half rewriting history because the historical figure that falls in love with this black woman, which allows uh, black characters to have context in this narrative, um, it was actually like a, a big like proponent of continuing the, the transatlantic slave trade and things like that in England using slaves and sort of how this is rewriting history. Uh, it mentions that Hugh Jackman movie that did a similar thing with like uh, the carnival thing. Um, I, I was I was clever because she talks about like the Haiti revolution with it where all the slaves revolted and how that scared England. And I was like, haha, I know a little bit about that from Black Sails. Look at me. Historical context through fucking bullshit fiction. You gotta love it. Um, she talks about like stereotypical black. Oh, she talks about the strong, like, strong female character thing here about how like it actually became a trope for like black women to only sort of get like these strong um black woman roles where it's sort of like this stereotype of the strong black woman who doesn't take any shit or whatever um and sort of how like trying because the critique would be like oh there's no black women in roles in movies so let's give them all the roles that are like very strong roles and it sort of misses the point like black women can be weak too they can be vulnerable they can be like the main love interest they can be the pretty one they can be all of these things there doesn't just have to be like either like a slave woman or a strong contemporary black woman that doesn't take any shit um like it's sort of like we're casting them into like these stereotypes rather than just letting like it's almost like it almost comes full circle where it's almost like you shouldn't really worry about race when creating a character like you can create like this very complex female character and then not even think about what race they are until you get to casting uh which is kind of colorblind casting but it's not the point like colorblind casting how it's explained at the beginning of the video is sort of like they're going to specifically give black women like traditionally white roles so it can show that black people can do them too not necessarily just making a role and the race being irrelevant to who is in it um obviously in historical context this doesn't work because then you're kind of rewriting history and all these things uh and, and th there's a lot of it's like more of a complicated issue than just like um just fucking like fixing it with putting black people in certain roles like these are sort of issues that can't be fixed this e this easily um i'm still scrolling through the uh timeline here to see if i forgot any of the points she even brings up how hamilton can be critiqued of this and and things like that um oh no to get another ad i feel like that's most of the things we're saying and it's sort of putting a sh sh the conclusion here i scrolled over that right before the menu log ads fucking started um about how like it's kind of putting a bow on history and in, in like this fake type of like existence and how it could sort of be insulting in the same time because i think a lot of the appeal of bridgerton is like oh now we get to see black people in sort of these traditional like uh like garbs these traditional outfits that only white people ever get to put on in movies so it's sort of cool to see like uh black people in this sort of aesthetic where they usually cast out of them um but whereas this also sort of uh can be harmful in certain ways so it's sort of a, it's a multi uh, layered issue that's sort of talked about here and i think the video is very well done um I can't remember much about the production or if there was anything wrong with anything else. I think it was just a very competently made video with a lot of interesting points. I do think Brody de Chanel can have the cult of personality thing sometimes. I don't think it's like as dry as like a Sarah Z video, um, but it's not as performative as like a ContraPoints video or anything like that. Uh, but I don't particularly remember any performative aspects of this video, which can be a good thing. That sounds like a bad thing. Like performance.
informative, that's bad, but no, that's not what I meant. But I think that's all we have to say about the number two video of the month. She usually has a video out every month, so hopefully there's one in March. And we'll talk about it then, because it might have been number one if there wasn't a clear fucking number one for this month. Now let's get into number one. I watched all of Loop on the 3rd and regretted it by Karibu Kuhn. February the 9th, 2021. Another another Shaves video that I didn't watch for like two weeks until after it came out. But my fucking God, this he, he has not missed since the fucking Guru and Lagana video. And that's only because I haven't watched most of his other videos. But every video since then has been fucking incredible. Every scripted video. He also does a bunch of AMVs that uh, uh, nobody watches, which is a very sad thing. I know the feel when you make something where I talk about wrestling and nobody watches, even though I, I would rather they watch that than my other shit. Uh, I feel like that's how poor Shabes uh, feels about uh, his AMVs. Shabes, obviously, the uh, forefather of this concept of Digest. He runs uh, Anime Digest, and he tube Digest every week. Um, this video is fucking incredible on, like, multiple layers, and I'm starting to get a fucking headache, and I've been recording for nearly two and a half hours, not two and a half hours, one and a half hours, and nearly exactly, so I'm fucking tired, but we're going to do the video, it's justice. The fucking intro here that's playing now is fucking, like, spectacular. It's time to an idol song, to the war idol song that is fucking awesome. Uh, I wonder if he got claimed, I wonder, what, like, can I use idol songs in my videos, or am I going to get fucked? Because I only get money from ad revenue right now. Patreon is like $26 a month, right? Uh, since I stopped the bonus videos, Patreon ain't growing. Um, so I can't risk. I can't put fucking, what? What did you put? 25 million hours into this video uh, and try and rely on Patreon fucking dollars to fund it. So if he didn't get any ad re- revenue, then I can't use idle songs. But I'm actually curious if he got away. I don't know. There's probably no... He probably got claimed, right? And then you have to share the revenue. I ain't got enough revenue to share, motherfucker. So I'm not going to use idol songs. But it's so cool. I wish I could use idol songs in my videos. This song is really good, though. And I loved it. And I recognized it immediately. And it was timed to all these cool clips. And he's doing a bunch of match shots uh, with, like, loop and running. And it's super fucking awesome. It shows this incredible-looking 3D movie. Uh, that looks like a fucking Pixar film or something. That looks awesome. I should preface this. I know very little about Lupin the Third going into this video. I knew. Uh, I'd heard uh, Digi talk about it a little bit um, over the years, and probably some other anime YouTubers talk about it a little bit. Um, and now, Shapes has done a big video, so I now know a bunch of things because of this video, but I've never seen any of the Lupin movies. But um, there's a good point. I'll talk about this in my notes when I read it, because I did take notes on this video. That um, until halfway through, I was convinced this wasn't a video about Loop on the Third, and it was about something completely different, uh, and I loved it for that. But then it became about Loop on the Third, and I also loved it for that. I'm just watching the intro here and the editing and the, cr- the faded over shit. Some incredible fucking shit is going on here. He, Shabes has always been, like, the editing boy. And it's been, like, can the content of the video actually match up with the editing? Um, usually it, it does pretty well. But in this video, it really does. Um, where do we start? Where did I start with my notes? What is there... What is there to say? There's a lot to fucking say. Uh, at first, I thought this video wasn't about Lupin the Third, and then it was. Inferring uh, that it's... All oh, right, the inferring point. I don't know if I want to start with this, but let's get into it anyway. So for the first 15... The, I have to explain. This video... Just fucking watch this video. This video is like the mind fuck of what it's like to make a fucking video. And it's the best representation of it I've ever seen, to the point where... I saw that it had like 30,000 views and overwhelming likes and I was like, and I was watching it and I was relating it, so, re- relating to it so deeply on a creative level where I was like, what does anybody that doesn't make YouTube videos possibly get out of this video? Because this video isn't about loop on the third at all. This is about the mind fuck that it is to try and figure out what a video you're making is about in the middle of it and after you're cutting, changing the script and you're editing shit together and you have no idea. I talk about this all the time. And it was very relatable because I was going through the Alliance script at this point, And it was just fucking me on all ends for like a whole month. That's why there was no videos in February. Because this video just wouldn't make itself. And I couldn't fucking make it. And I couldn't figure out what it was about. But I remember with Core Themes and Changing Context and Attack on Titan, I had a very similar process where I could... Like, it wasn't until like the day before I recorded that full script that I even knew properly what that video was about. Because at first you have the idea, right? Let's make a video where we talk about all the loop in the third. And then he, he has this existential crisis in the 
video. It's reflected through the editing because there's like three timelines for this video. It does some crazy shit that's fucking awesome and like revolutionary and I've never seen this type of video being made before and it's all the coolest ideas and it's so fucking sick. Um, so like he, he goes through the, like the, what he was thinking when he was trying to make this video about, okay, he had probably had the idea. I'm going to watch all the loop on the third shit because that's some completionist shit. I relate to that. Uh, and then he's like, then I'm going to make a video about them. But then he's having this existential crisis about what the fuck does this video actually mean? What is it actually about? He has this meme about where he shows a tier list at some point. Is it just going to be a, like an, an overblown tier list video where I talk about the best ones? Is it supposed to be about recommending Loop on the third? And then he's like, no, it shouldn't be about that. Should it just be about me talking about the ones I like and the ones I don't like? And he's like, no, it shouldn't be about that. And what it ends up being is like this three timeline thing of him cutting together different drafts of the script to try and make this overall point about what Loop in the third is and what makes it good. Good. And it gets there eventually, but at the fir- for like the first fifteen minutes, I was just like, "This is just an existential like uh, dread mind fuck about what it is like to make a YouTube video." And I've never related to something so profoundly in my fucking little life before. It was fucking sick. Um, just like the different timelines, he has this gimmick at some point where he cuts off like the last two words of every sentence, and you already know what the end of the sentence is, and it's very clever because you still get the point, but it's like this funny like, oh no, this video is coming apart at the seams, and it's like constructed this way, right? Like how to construct this video this way, it's insane how much he would have had to thought about this, and I bet it was probably some fucking weird shit where it just came together somehow in this regard, and it wasn't entirely all planned, but for it to work this well, you sort of have to assume that it was this well planned out, and that he planned out the three timelines and the three different fucking draft scripts he was going to record, and how the ideas would conflict with each other and like even contradict each other sometimes, but it would all work on the grander narrative to explain what Loop on the Third is and why it's good and sort of in this indirect, very abstract way. And you know me, I love that fucking abstract shit more than anything. Um, plus there's always loop on the third images on screen, and it's just some fascinating shit, especially for somebody who generally doesn't really know what it's about, but kind of confer from just the context clues I've gotten throughout my life. Um, and it's to the point where, like, th- there are some striking character designs. There's the one dude with the big beard, and the samurai dude, and the girl, and obviously loop on, and I think there's a fifth man, though, which is the... Um, cop dude but you like for the first 15 minutes where it's not really about Lupin it's sort of about like what the fuck is going on in this video why is there three timelines in this video what is what the fuck is going on uh, and by the time it actually becomes about loop on the third, like, f- for the last 15 minutes of the video, you've, like, seen so much footage of these characters that you kind of, as somebody who's never seen it, I understood, like, all the characters and what they were about just by seeing images on them on screen. And, like, it, it was, like, this familiarity of, like, I had inferred, like, everything about these characters. So when he actually started talking about them, it was like I understood and, like, I had a frame of reference for what he was talking about, and I could understand what he was talking about, even though I hadn't seen a single loop on the third thing. I think he says at the beginning of the video that the video is also for people who haven't seen any loop on the third or whatever. Um, so I don't know if it was constructed in that way, but it was, like, incredible how well it worked. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm starting to get things. Like, I'm starting to get it, because I've just seen like, mini scenes of Lupin doing some wacky shit, and then the girl doing some sexy shit, and then the fucking samurai dude and the breed dude getting into conflict because they're obviously the fucking Zanji and Soro of this crew, and just, like, them being cool and silhouettes and weird, like, globetrotting adventure-type shit. It's just like, oh, I get it. I, like, get it. And then it, it all works so fucking well. Am I making sense? I don't know. I fucking think I am. At first, I thought this video wasn't about uh, Loop on the Third, and then it was. Inferring what it's about before you get to that part. The intro on the match shots, we talked about that. Uh, Shaves doesn't particularly have the cult of personality, but he's becoming the best YouTuber right now. I think this is true. I think definitely in AniTube, Shaves is, like, easily the best. Like, Nate isn't making fucking videos. That Ghost in the Shell video came out, like, last year, and that was, like, the last truly great Nate video that was, like, the performative aspect of Nate being this cult of personality, his song at the end, everything then, the points in the middle. It was, like, the quintessential, like, this is the, this is what Nate can do, and this is what he brings to the table. B, or formerly Digi, like, they're not trying to make this content, they're not trying to be the king of AniTube anymore, queen of AniTube now, um, fucking merge them into one, is what I'm saying, like, and who else is there, like, Super Eye Patch Wolf will always make Super Eye Patch Wolf content, Mother's Basement will always make Mother's Basement content, they will never make a video this good, they can't, they're just not 
the type of people to make it. And usually when I talk about like my favorite YouTubers or whatever, they usually are these cult of personality types, like B or fucking best guy ever, right? These fucking bombastic, like in your face idiots who will say some crazy shit and then try and justify it. And can they justify it? Well, that's the whole point. They really are these cults of personality. I don't think Shabes is that really. Like, I don't think any of the takes look the hottest here. I don't know if he has the performative aspect, especially of innate, but like, I think he's the best. I think he just is now because those two are making content episodes and they're great and they're fun, but they ain't video essays they ain't analysis videos right now like who else who else is fucking making youtube videos like craft dwarf again is a very literal like let's do some thematic analysis shit he can't make this shit he can't do it nobody can it's just like the best he's the best because i had this because uh, i was thinking about all this last night and i it was like 5 a.m so of course i got a creative fucking spurt then when i'm fucking drooling in my chair trying to go to sleep i had the idea of possibly making like a top 10 like analytical YouTubers or top 10 video essay YouTubers and was trying to figure out where I would put people uh, like Broey D. Chanel and where like B and Best Guy Ever would go. And I think I came to the conclusion that Shabes would have to be number one on that list. Like nobody is making, like I'm not really anticipating, like if, if B comes out with that Attack on Titan video, that'll be sick. I think that'll be cool. I'm scared I'll disagree with everything and hate it, but we'll see. If Best Guy Ever comes out with another Ghost in the Shell quality video, then it will rival a Shabes video, I think. But outside of that, like, I don't think the bread tube political slash media people, they're all making similar types of videos that are all really good and probably have more interesting things to say than this loop on the third video, but they aren't this video. They just aren't. Like, uh, B's fucking Serial Experiments Lane videos are kind of like this video. Like, We Have Accepted Mediocrity is kind of like this video and sort of how well edited it is and when, like, just going through... But, again, that relies on more of the cult of personality aspect of B. Um, like, nobody can do this is sort of what I'm getting at. Like, who... I know Shaves really likes Beyond Ghibli. I don't really find their videos that interesting. I'm trying to figure out who he thinks is, like, the best. Um... I know he talks about... and Matthew. He mentions Matthew Matosa. It's funny, because this is probably the best video of the year, and I thought we should do top 10 best videos of the year at the end of the year, uh, since we're doing this top 10 list. And he references probably the the only contender, which is the Matthew Matosa's meta micro videos, where he talks about um, uh, the point we talked about last time, where it was about uh, how people born in 2020 can't really experience all of the classic video games and how he relates that to anime. Because he seems to have inherited the B, um, like drive to want to watch everything like i am very much not this i have no interest in watching every anime to ever exist anime isn't even my main thing um even manga which i guess is my main thing i have no interest in watching or reading all manga i'm very much like the i will reread berserk 30 times to make 70 videos on berserk i don't care i'm not really interested in watching everything whereas shape seems to be more on that train um so he sort of in- inherited that. And it's it's a very interesting, like, mindset to come into this on. Um, I know he works in industry as, like, a translator, I think. So there's also that perspective. It's just, like, the concept here of the three timelines and then coming out. And then he starts making points about Loop on the Third and sort of about the, the, the different, like, places in the world things take place and in, like, subtitles and how he likes when episodes have subtitles and sort of how there's a lot of average loop on the third material and sort of the they them shoehorning the cop character and sometimes it's something he doesn't like. I'm just going through the timeline trying to remember the points. Um, there's like a graph thing here that I was trying to pause on. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just like... It's not really about the point here, right? And that's always how I felt about the best videos. It's not about Nate's points. It's not about Beatrix's points in the videos. It's not about whether or not I agree with we have accepted mediocrity. It's like, is this a fucking art piece I'm seeing right now that I would, like, put up with anything else as, like, quality shit that is experimental, that is innovative, that is fucking great, that is engaging, that is weirdly abstract and... Like, it shows me things... Because, again, the points being made aren't necessarily what are blowing my mind here. It's just the creation aspect and the relatability on the front of trying to figure out what the fuck this video is going to be. And, like, I've, I've started thinking about this, and I almost did this in a bunch of my videos, where I just sort of wanted to break that fourth wall, almost, of just explaining how I was having trouble making the script and incorporating that into, like, the first paragraph of the core themes and changing context in Attack on Titan 
fucking um, video where I would just be like, all right, this video kind of seems complicated, but it's really not. And then explaining basically what I was talking about there. And I eventually cut that bit and just went into it and tried to be over-explanatory in the terms that I was using in that video. And I thought about doing that in the Alliance video. Now, I've been working on this Alliance video all month, and it was, I was so relatable to everything that was happening in this video, to the point where I've delayed it until after Attack on Titan finishes, and I want to make it the big grand, like my opinion on the ending of the series. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but we'll. that's a different topic. And it's like, the fact that he incorporated that idea that I had of just explaining the th- like how the video is being annoying to me and how I can't entirely script out properly what I'm trying to portray. And to make that like the aesthetic of the first half of the video is incredible to me. It's a fantastic idea and it's executed in a way I can't execute like things like this. I can't do this editing. I can't do this type of narration stuff. Like it's better than me. Like, when I look at a craft store video, like, I think the the thematic analysis and the writing is better than me, but it's like, I'll fucking, if I tried hard enough, I could make a video that good. I don't, I don't know how to make a video this good, and it's, like, truly fucking good shit, and it's, uh, it's the real shit. What else can we say? So, really, I really, like, like, the shit that blows my mind in this video, like, the Lupin stuff, like, he's already got me 15 minutes in, so when he starts talking about Lupin-specific things, um, again, the imagery of Lupin holds you over, where it's like, this is some fucking cool shit that's going on on my screen right now. I want to watch some of this shit. I probably never will, but I probably will eventually, but I ain't gonna fucking do it anytime soon. Um, talks about the general characterization of the characters here, about the Lupin girls here, talking about, he talks about James Bond at some point relating it to that and sort of the tropes through, it is an interesting thing where you have these sort of re- reiterations of characters that all have to have the, like the same sort of narrative beats that it has to hit on. Um, there's like the one shot of the girl like hitting a bong, which I can't believe exists in an anime. I've seen that screenshot, like that clip before as a gif and I always thought it was like a fan animation and I was like holy shit that's from Lupin like how the fuck did they get away with that doesn't Japan like murder drugs anybody that's ever taken a drug is killed on arrival in Japan isn't that how it works there or have I been led to believe this by the internet falsely um was she smoking tobacco through the bong <laughs> I don't think you can do that but um what the fuck that was real cool um Talking about the detail on the watches, I just scrolled through the timeline. That was a cute point. Um, he also has the the uh, Beatrix like knowledge of just the industry and sort of the the directors and the composers and sort of the history of like just anime in general that I feel like a lot of other YouTubers don't have. And he adds that to all the videos. Real shit. Um, I don't know what else to say. It's like a real creative at the beginning in a way that I think might only relate to other creators to the point where I questioned why anybody cared about this video that hadn't made um, YouTube videos before. Ah, I can read the rest of my notes. I didn't even finish that. Um, Shakes doesn't have the cult of personality, but he's becoming the best YouTuber right now. So many ideas about the horrors of making a YouTube video essay and the cute, I hope... Ah, so that's like... That's the... um. All the horrors of making a YouTube essay, I talked about that. He also has the cute, I, I hope you aren't browsing in another tab meme that I think is... It's a, it's a creative little video idea of just sort of like calling out the audience for something they're probably doing because you usually do it and it's like, ha, and it'll make them pause and like get their attention. I think that's... I, I feel like I've seen that. Like, I think Matthew Matosis basically did that in the Meta Micro videos, but I still like it as an idea and as a cute little like... I'm using the fact that this is a YouTube video to like its full potential. It's sort of like a realizing the potential of YouTube videos and the and understanding how the medium works and how people usually consume this. Um, you can do this in like, you, you'd have to do this in different ways in different mediums, right? If it's a TV, you understand your audience is probably like sitting on the couch half paying attention. Uh, so it'd be like, look up from the newspaper or whatever the fuck. But now in this YouTube context, it's like, get out of that other tab and pay attention, motherfucker. It's really good. Um, Ruining Lupin for him and the such. That was sort of the point of the video. How do you make a video? Uh, oh, it's also like this is such a general topic that it's like I've thought about doing this. I remember I, I was going to do those Mad Men episode videos where it would just be like about season uh, one, episode 10 was the first one I ever tried to do. And like just a general video about that episode without like kind of a thesis outside of like 
well, let's explain why this episode is good. It's a nightmare to make those types of videos. And I feel like this is what Shaves went through. It was like, I want to make a video about all of Lupin the Third. And you're like, okay. And you're like, what the fuck is the point? What am I doing this for? And I remember I wrote that script like seven fucking times and then I just stopped ever thinking about ever doing those videos because it's like, what parts of the episode do you focus on? Is it going to be just about one subplot of the episode, like the Rachel and Don stuff? Or do you incorporate it all into the thematic point? How do you identify the thematic point? How do you introduce the video? Is the audience going to understand what's going on? So it's sort of like, how do you make a video about such a general topic? What do you say? What do you even want to say? And all this stuff. What is the? What was the original idea of the burst of information? I feel like with a lot of YouTubers, at least this is how I am, so I'm projecting here, but like... I usually get an idea for a video and like in that moment I fully understand the idea and everything that will be said in that video and then I go to write down like I usually come up with a title and then it equates I usually have an idea in the back of my head that I don't know how to form into like a thing and then I'll have the title will come to me and I'll be like oh and that works with that idea and it connects and then I'll like write down the title and I'll think about it and I'll like write it in my head as I'm just thinking about it and be like, this is great. This is the best video I've, idea I've ever had. I'm a genius. It'll fucking all work out. And then you never get back to that point. Like you'll never remember how everything connected in your mind in that one moment to give you the original burst of idea and the burst of information and for you to understand anything. But you still have that title and you vaguely remember the points you wanted to make. So then when you get to the scripting phase you're trying to figure out what it is and you're trying to get back to that burst of information, that rush of like uh, initiative that you had back then and it never comes back to you and then you've fucking written two pages and you've gone off on a tangent and you're trying to remember what the fuck the original point of this video was and you can't remember and that's when you start having these questions, especially when it's on a general topic and like if the if the title of the video is uh, 10 reasons why, what the fuck? You can realize, oh, I need to get back on track and write about these 10 reasons. But when it's as vague as, like, I want to make a video about Loop on the Third, or I want to make a video about this one episode of Mad Men, you got to, like, you got to try and remember what the fuck was the original idea you had to make this video. And it's like this mind fuck that if you made YouTube videos, I feel like you'll understand. The behind the scene aspects of telling uh, whoever he lives with that he's recording something. He breaks the fourth wall a lot in this and, to- and throws like behind the scenes things in that are like incredibly fascinating. And the way it's done works so well in this abstract way. Like when he's like, there's this loud moment where he's like getting mad at the fact that he can't like script out a video properly. And like it cuts to him awkwardly explaining to his roommate or whoever lives with him, like, oh yeah, I was recording something to a video and it's really cute. And it's, like, a behind-the-scenes thing of, like, embodying, like, the confusion that he's going through and trying to figure out what the fuck this video is. It's really good. Uh, Cutting off the last bit of his lines, again, that was another little motif that I loved of just, like, sort of playing with what it is to make a YouTube video video essay. It's really cool. The tier list meme I already talked about. I uh, I wonder how he made this and how he gets around the songs. We talked about the songs at the beginning. Just explain the thesis. Uh... It's like, it it always comes back to this. I feel like when you're in that mode of like, I don't know what any of this is about. If you just explain the thesis in the video, if you're like the video, like if literally I started every video with the the thesis of this video is that core themes change in Attack on Titan through time and changing context. Like, I feel like that would help like writing the script and everything and the audience is understanding. Like that's the simple solution, but you never like come to that conclusion. So it's weird. Um explain what he wants this video to be we talked about all that and then my last note here is that i need sound effects i love the click and this is how he would cut off those lines he would do a little click i never have sound effects in my videos maybe that's hey that's something we need to look into um that was my last little observation i think we're done with this fucking goddamn video and this fucking video in general as in this loop on the third video and top 10 analysis videos of the month Oh, two hours again. Kill me, kill me, kill me. Thank God I wasn't recording Catching Up with Vinland Saga after this. That'll be in a few days. And it'll be here on the second channel that we're doing here. Um, I'm going to catch up on Vinland Saga. We're going to do a review of all the chapters I missed. I think I'm down like four chapters. Uh, I hear not a lot has been going on still, but fuck it. We'll catch up for second channel content. Um... Digest will be back next month. Uh, we kind of did a Digest-esque video response to the Just Ride Attack on Titan video about fascism and things like that on the main channel. I'm sure you've seen that before you saw this, though, where it's um, 
it's like two hours long as well of me going through and talking about that video. I know Shabes talked about it very recently on um, on on the digest that came out this morning. So I wonder what he said about that video. I saw it was at the beginning, so that's usually where he puts the worst videos of the month. So yeah, I'm still not watching digest as it comes out because I still have it in my mind that I'm going to go back through and catch up on all of them. And my stupid completionist brain won't let me watch the new ones. What if he covers one of my videos one day? Am I just gonna not going to watch it? Because No, because I watched him talk about us when we originally started Digest, so I probably would watch that. How vain. Um, but whatever. Second channel content is coming. Hopefully this channel can get to 1,000 subs quickly so I can make some fucking money off this shit. Uh, to make money, I also have a Patreon, but I don't think you would subscribe for Digest. Uh, you probably subscribe because you like video essays on the main channel. But it's there anyway. Twitter and all that. We're getting Twitter followers now. Twitch followers. We're nearly at 400 Twitch followers. That's fun. We Twitch all, we Twitch all the time. We stream all the time. All the shit is in the description, all right? I'm done with this fucking video. I want to leave. Um, so, be back next month with more Digest. Shaves was number one this month. Um, support links in the description below. Thanks.